I know, $13. That's not a typo. Good evening and welcome <clears throat> to the Wednesday, November 14, 2018 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. <clears throat> May we please pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Council Caitlin Jordan has let us know she'll be late this evening. Would the town clerk continue with the roll call? Chairman Sullivan? Here. Councilor Garvin? Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? <coughs> Councilor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councilor Lennon? Here. Councilor Randall? Here. And Councilor Straw? Here. All right, thank you. Well, I, I don't know if I should introduce the next item or not. I, I think not. I think I'll turn that over to the vice chair. Sure. Well, I know uh, tonight's a really special night, and we have a few few comments that um, folks are uh, certainly interested in making, and then uh, uh, some other special things for you guys. So, um, Penny, do you want to start us off? Sure, I will. Um, I have to tell you that as I was sitting uh, reflecting on what I wanted to say to each of you this evening, Sarah and Jessica, um, it started to become pretty redundant as I, uh, as I kind of said, here's what I want to say to Jessica, here's what I want to say to Sarah. So um, I combined it together. So, uh, because I think team isn't about agreeing, it's about bringing diverse thinking and skills to the conversation. And I believe our team, our council is stronger because of yours, Jessica's, and yours, Sarah's willingness to bring your perspectives to the table, which um, in, in many instances weren't 100% uh, aligned, but caused people to really dig deeper into their thinking. Um, I really think that um, there's going to be a gap without the two of you here on the council because of the knowledge that you bring, Jessica, the depth of understanding and the, the willingness that you always take and dig into the history and the archives of an issue and bring that to the table. And Sarah, as you look and you look at things and you take it from a passionate and emotional perspective, and uh, I love the way that the facts, data, and logic and the, and the passion uh, come together at the table here. Um, so I hope the two of you won't hesitate uh, once you're no longer sitting at this table to make a phone call or send an email to offer your perspective and guidance uh, like so many of our uh, counselors have done in the past. So thank you for serving both of you and I I've, I've just, I can't even express how wonderful I think this team has been. I think we just complimented each other so well, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Penny. Um, I'll add to those uh, comments and accolades and say that tonight we recognize two dedicated and long-tenured colleagues who are moving on after a combined nearly two decades of service as town councilors. I do find it both ironic yet also altogether fitting that Jessica and Sarah are riding off into the municipal government sunset together. <laughs> <laughs> While often on opposite sides of many issues and debates, they are two women who time and time again fiercely advocated for what they thought was in the best interest of the town and have demonstrated a love of this community that is matched by, by few. I could go on and on about the various roles each of you has held during your time on the council, but frankly, it would be a shorter list of positions you haven't filled. Each has held the gavel as chair, served on every one of the council's standing committees, and done important work on ad hoc committees, such as the Future for Open Space Preservation, Solid Waste and Recycling Long Range Planning, and Comprehensive Plan Committees, just to name a few. Three years ago, I stood for election to the council for the first time in a field that included both Jessica and Sarah. As a newcomer to town politics, I felt fortunate to come on board with two people from whose experience I could immediately draw upon in finding my way as the new guy. And in that first year, it was just me as the only guy up here. It has been a tremendous experience working with you both, and I am a better counselor for learning from and modeling the best examples of your service, being available and accessible to citizens, integrity and transparency in conducting the business of governing, 
and a willingness to sometimes be a dissenting or even lone vote against the easy choice and popular opinion when you thought it meant acting in the best interests of the entire community. Sarah, I appreciate the passion and zeal you brought to the council. You frequently pushed us to think bigger than just our sometimes mundane procedural and esoteric work, which we all know how much you really loved. <laughs> but in all seriousness, you have championed a standard of excellence here in Cape and consistently pushed us and those in the community to live up to that re reputation and be a leader that other towns admire. Jessica, you were one of the first people that encouraged me to run for office when we worked together in planning for the future of the Recycling Center, and I thank you for that. Even though we might not always agree on things, I have always appreciated the dedication you brought to your job as a counselor. It, is all, it has also been inspiring to watch you on your journey as a lifelong learner, and I know you're anxious to put that hard work to use. One of my most important criteria for a good counselor is someone that is prepared and willing to do the work, and there is nobody that I've seen that works harder than you. So as we bid you farewell, we thank you both for your years of commitment and dedication to this job. We, the council, but more importantly, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth are the better for your service. Good luck to you both, and try not to be too hard on us when you're sitting across from us in the audience. <laughs> thank you very much. So you both have, um, because of your long tenured service, received a number of gifts over the years um, uh, in recognition of that, but um, we still want to have something special for you here tonight. So um, Sarah, this is for you. Here as chair. Oh, okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you Thank you very much. Oh, a wine glass. Yeah. You guys excited you ran now? <laughs> I didn't know we had Only Cape Elizabeth did. wine glasses. <laughs> Why don't we have them sitting up here at night? <laughs> Should I make a motion that we serve wine at the company? <laughs> Awesome, that is beautiful. Awesome. The German black on it. Whoops, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, that's beautiful. Wow. The avid gardener. I will. This will come in handy. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sarah, um, would you like to say a few words? I would love to. Um, extemporaneously, I didn't prepare anything, but um, thank you all. You know what, Penny, I, I agree with you. This has been a really, really great group. Um, <coughs> I've been on so many different councils, I, can, I can't really remember them all, including time in between. But um, this has been really, really great. Um, we don't always agree, sometimes it's passionate, sometimes it's um, contentious, but I just feel like we all really respect each other and we've gotten great work done. Um, and you know, speaking of lone votes, I guess I had one or two. <laughs> Um, but I never felt shamed by that. I felt like you guys respected it, even if you disagreed. So that's, I think, a really functioning council. Um, bigger picture, I just wanna 
give a shout out to this community. Um, I really think that we are the envy of so many communities in Maine and New England and the country in that um, we just have wonderful people who work here. And I, by that, I mean this, the school staff and um, our superintendent and all the faculty and such great kids, which I feel so privileged over the years to have gotten to know some of them. Um, and our department chairs, I'm thrilled that I got to work with two town managers and Deb Lane, who keeps the entire town running. She's the unsung hero and councils. Um, and it just, I feel privileged and I'm sitting here feeling very nostalgic. Um, and above all else, perhaps, I think the citizens of this town are really so fabulous. They are just passionate and they're involved and they show up. The volunteerism here I think is, is unparalleled. People do every role up and down from little things to huge amounts of time with a smile and a willingness. Every time we try to fill committees, we get too many people. Um, and they show up in our chambers and they yell at us, which I just love. Um, and they, you know, they have more people than seats and people in this community really, really care about the community and every aspect of it. And that um, I think is what's made this job so worthwhile and so both challenging and gratifying. And I would just like to thank the citizens for electing me and trusting me to represent you in times that I know you felt I didn't very well, um, and times that you did, I really appreciate your your trust and your faith, and I hope I've done um, a good job in general of reflecting your interests and working hard for you. So to everyone listening and out there, I just extend huge gratitude. And we will be back, and I hope we get the Jim Walsh um, over three minute pass when we want to talk to you. <laughs> he takes as long as he wants, and I think that should be a council rule. If you're an ex council, you don't have to stop at three minutes. So thank you. Well, thanks, Sarah. Um, so I'll just say a few things. Um, first of all, to my outgoing colleague, Sarah, um, it has always been interesting, <laughs> fascinating, and um, really important. You know, I think frequently you and I have been on opposite ends of many, many issues, and, and that's very healthy because, you know, we've been able to represent different thoughts and ideas at times and um, uh, for our community, and I, I think that it's always been a privilege, and I, I just, uh, when I look back on, on the years together, and then you had, you served for nine years with a three-year break, and I went straight through, but, <clears throat> but you were always around, and in your three-year hiatus, you were very active. <laughs> well, and, and you know, in pr promoting your views and staying involved in the town, which speaks to the, the passion you've always shown. So I, my hat's off to you, and it's been uh, quite a pleasure and privilege, and at times <laughs> exasperating because <laughs> it just is. That's the way politics are, is and can be. But you know, I'll certainly miss seeing you and with everyone, and um, and as we've learned to work to we, with each other over the years. I'd like to say the, to the voters, thank you for, as Sarah was saying, thank you for your faith for electing electing me three times to the council. It has been an absolute privilege and um, to, to work for the community. And I've enjoyed, I really have enjoyed it tremendously. And I would say just about every minute, it's been fascinating from short-term rentals to gun, gun club and firing range ordinance to libraries to uh, paper streets to Fort Williams. I mean, we've had some tremendous issues in the last nine years and it's been wonderful to be <coughs> part of that to be part of all of that. I've, always, I've enjoyed all the counselors. And I thank you for all your work this year and all your support. Um, and I'd like to congratulate our counselors elect that are here tonight. It's wonderful to see you and we have to congratulate Councilor Garvin for his reelection. I think that um, what we have here as counselors, I think this is as good as it gets as far as politics and representing um, our community because it's nonpartisan. 
We're right here in our own backyard. The work that we do, we can visually see it. You know, people can come up to us in the IGA if they're happy or they're unhappy, and they do. And I always welcome that. I always enjoy that. I, I'm delighted that we have, uh, we usually or frequently have more candidates for the positions available. And I hope that continues to be the case because I hope we continue to encourage people to run for our office and to run for town council and school board because it keeps us very engaged and, and active in our community. I'd also finally like to uh, thank our staff because I don't think any of us could achieve a fraction of what we've been able to achieve over the years without the support of the staff we have here in Cape Elizabeth, which is absolutely outstanding. And we are so lucky to have the caliber of manager and clerk and department heads that we have. And we, we wouldn't be able to accomplish anything for our citizens without their support. And so I, I've always been in awe of, of, of our staff. So thank you all for all that you do. And that's really all I have to say other than um, we'll, I'll miss you all. And I'll, I'll be around, but I'll probably be pretty quiet for a while. Yeah. So anyway, moving on. <coughs> Town Council reports and correspondence. Are there any reports and, or correspondence that councils would like to share? Councilor Penny Jordan. I just want to remind people that the draft of the comprehensive plan is out online and uh, I would love to, uh, the committee uh, would love to receive more comments from people. So um, while you're celebrating Thanksgiving, you could sit down and you could read the comprehensive plan. Just go out under uh, hot topics on the website and um, send your comments along. It would be great. Anyone else? I'd like to take the op this opportunity to thank uh, Deb Lane, our town clerk, for managing an unbelievably busy election <laughs> election day. Uh, it was really something. The turnout was incredible. I think it was 69 or 70 percent, was it? Which was fantastic. Again, another indication of our active community. It was wonderful, but it was pretty crazy at times and um, but you know thank you for all of the management of that and keeping everybody sane and doing their jobs and all the staff that you were able to pull together and I know we had other staff here at Town Hall that helped um, as well so thanks to them. We'll pass that along. So yeah. Pulled from oh. various departments. So. Yeah it was quite a challenge and um, but you know sign of the time so Anyhow, and, and we have an agenda item that um, is going to speak to some of that too because there were people that waited in line. I, I waited on an hour and 45 minutes. I understand the most was two and a half hours. That's what I heard. I mean, there may be someone who stood in line longer than that, but, but you know, it was, it was quite, quite a challenge that day. So thanks again for keeping it all going. And how late was everybody? You were up till. For that, for that morning or something? Board and I left it at 2.45. <laughs> That's amazing. <coughs> All right, and the finance committee report. On the finance chair, please. Thank you. Um, before is the uh, monthly dashboard. Um, as has been the case the last few months, not anything significantly changing month over month. Uh, we'll point out a couple of things on the revenue side, pacing ahead of um, ahead of projection. Uh, we continue to um, do better than forecast in both the area of excise taxes and building permits, so people buying and registering vehicles and uh, doing work on homes in town. Um, the other thing on the expenditure side, um, you'll see we're, we're pacing positively against public works overtime and salt. Um, if you're watching the weather forecast, that's likely to change rather soon. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, we're continuing to keep an eye on the legal services line, which um, even though we did boost that amount for the current budget year, um, you know, based on the services that we're incurring uh, for a variety of reasons, 
uh, that continues to be a, an area to watch. So, um, Matt, anything else you wanted to highlight? Uh, th those are the those are the primary uh, areas that that we're looking at. And the other area I was, I was happy to see was revenue sharing is tracking slightly above where we were at this point last year, about three thousand dollars difference. But every every bit helps. So. Uh, Things are definitely trending in a positive manner. Any questions on the dashboard? Any questions on the other uh, control and distribution appendices? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now have the opportunity for citizens to address the town council on anything that is on, on an issue rather that is not on this this evening's agenda. Would anyone like to address the council? on anything not on tonight's agenda. No, nope, seeing no one, we'll move on. <clears throat> Can we please have the town manager's monthly report? I'd, I'd be happy to provide that, Madam Chairman. Uh, before I get started, I would, I'd just like to thank both Council Lennon and Chairman Sullivan for your work. It's been a pleasure uh, serving you in, in two different capacities over the uh, 18 years that I've been with the town. Uh, <laughs> with my role changing uh, and having you both on the interview panel that, that placed me in this position, I am extremely grateful for your for your sound judgment and making a good hire. But, <laughs> but in all seriousness, uh, your dedication to being uh, uh, the, and showing servant leadership that, that you do in this position is, is greatly appreciated by the staff as well. The support that you provided us uh, over the years has been unmatched and uh, we are grateful to have such great leadership and, and to have you. You will both be greatly missed. And uh, Chairman Sullivan, for sure, you know that the amount of time that we spend together over the past two years has been a, uh, a pleasure. And uh, the work that you've been, uh, brought out of me and encouraged me to do and working with you has been uh, a, a sure joy and helped me develop as a as leader in the town as well. So. Uh, thank you for that. And Council Lennon, I always appreciate your, your and my conversations and I, I will say you uh, have, have led us as staff members and me as manager to want to do better. Uh, you're, and I think you set a very high standards and it's one that we have, that we enjoy trying to match. So uh, we'll, uh, I will definitely miss having you on here as well. So thank you for your, all your work. That being said, I'll, I'll get into the, the the dry part of my report. Uh, <laughs> the past month has been extremely busy with the election, uh, early planning for the budget season, and managing the town's operation. I'd like to express my gratitude to Deborah Lane and her election staff and th for their hard work on this election with a large turnout. As you heard, it was just under 70%, which if we actually we had worked, as Deborah will say later, worked on the, the voter list, it was probably much greater than that, probably closer to 80% turnout. Uh, that's substantial, with the majority of them showing up on election day. I know this is an item for discussion later on, but I wanted to take the opportunity to thank Deborah and her staff for doing that. Uh, case in point, we shut down the tax office that day. Uh, half of the ACP uh, clerical staff was deployed to help on the election. Uh, two thirds of our business office staff was there, as well as uh, the, the various uh, Community, community representatives who, who come out to work for the town on that. So it, it takes a lot of hands to do that and every year it gets more challenging. So thank you, Deb, for that. You do, you're the best. As many have read, Paul Fenton was selected from a very competitive pool of applicants to become the next chief of police. Mr. Fenton's formal confirmation by the council will be on the December 10th agenda. We are very pleased to see Paul advance within the department. There will be and. Uh, Speaking of why he's going there, Chief Williams is retiring and there will be an open house celebrating Chief Williams' retirement on November 28th. And that'll be from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. at the Perputic Club. This is a good opportunity for folks to come out and thank the Chief and celebrate his career with the town or no, knowing the Chief to give him a hard time one last time. Uh, he, he can handle it. <laughs> In following up on the earlier discussion on the town center intersection, Public Works Director Bob Malley and myself Town Planner Maureen O'Mara and Police Chief Williams all met with Tom Erico with, from T.Y. Lynn to discuss the issues raised and possible solutions uh, to improve safety in the town center. Mr. Erico will be bringing Escopa services back to me for review for possible future action. The goal would be for improved safety for all modes of travel, motorized, bicycle, as well as pedestrian. So I'll be able to report back on that uh, as, we, as we advance. 
the discussions on the spur wing school reuse continue. I've had more meetings with Jim Rowe of the Cape Elizabeth Historical Society along with Joseph, Joseph Shalat, uh, who's an architect in town, to receive a scope of services estimate as well as cost estimates so that both groups may be able to keep the discussion of re relocating the society to the school building moving forward. And finally, I'd like to wish all a happy Thanksgiving next week and remind residents that the town operations will be closed on the Friday after Thanksgiving on November 23rd. Uh, thank you very much. That's my entire report. Thank you. Any, any questions for the town manager and his report? Okay. Moving on, <clears throat> uh, is next item is review of the draft minutes of the October 10, 2018 meeting. Um, is there a motion to approve the draft minutes of October 10, 2018? So moved. Councilor Penny Jordan is moved. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Lennon. Any edits, changes, errors? Councilor Randall. I believe, and I'm sorry I didn't email about this earlier, Deb, I just noticed it. Item um, 136. I believe I voted no. I'm sorry I didn't get to you sooner. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> any other any other errors or edits? So, we'll have to amend. Uh, let's see, Councillor Penny Jordan. Would you be willing oh, to? Oh, sorry, I was reading. That's, that's okay. Would you be willing to amend uh, to amend your motion to approve the minutes as corrected? I move that we approve the minutes um, as corrected by Valerie. Okay. And uh, we have a second, or Councilor Strauss, second, second that amendment. Any more discussion? All those in favor? All right, they are approved as amended. Yeah, welcome, thank you. Next item is a public hearing for the <laughs> sewer service area amendment of 33 Wells Road. Comments shall be limited to three minutes per person. Uh, however, the time could be extended by the, uh, by the majority vote of the councils present. Is there anyone, uh, well, wait a minute, what am I doing? I'm gonna open the public hearing. <laughs> It is now open. Anyone wishing to comment during this public hearing, please come to the podium. Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing and we'll proceed. Um, <clears throat> We, refu uh, we originally re referred this request to the planning board um, from the, uh, the owners of 33 Wells Road. The planning board uh, uh, approved their request. Um, we set the public hearing for this evening. And so now <coughs> we will proceed to vote on this item. I don't know if you'd like to add to this, Matt. Oh, sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, as you know, this is the fourth time I think that this is coming forward in front of the council. Uh, it's <laughs> to amend the sewer, sewer service area so Mr. and Mrs. Sarka can connect to the town's municipal sewer. Uh, they're, they're not here this evening, quite frankly, because I said that you know, we've, the council's seen this enough times now that it should be a fairly brief discussion, if at all. Uh, I know they do have their trench dug to reach to the point, and they are ready to make the connection tomorrow if the council <laughs> makes the uh, <laughs> approval this evening. So uh, I noticed there was work going on. <laughs> <laughs> they are ready. They are literally ready to go. So uh, that's 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 where we're at at this point in time. Okay. I do, I do need to disclose that they are neighbors of the farm, so. Thank you. And I, I believe you, you disclosed that before as well, and there were, there were no issues, so thank you for that. Okay, so <clears throat> could I have a motion then to approve the request for the service, sewer service area amendment at 33 Wells Road? So moved. Councilor Garvin, is there a second? Second. Uh, it was Councilor Penny Jordan I heard anyway before I saw your hand. <laughs> uh, any, any more discussion? Okay. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, item number 141, general assistance appendices. Uh, would anyone like to speak to this item? 
Well, no one is interested, so we'll move on. Um, we, we set a public hearing. We had that in September. On this, the council discuss, uh, did discuss um, these appendices. Is there a motion to approve? Madam Chair, if, if, if I may. Yep. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, it's going right. Uh, last month, it was approved to do uh, items, uh, appendices oh, yeah. A, B, and D were approved by the council. Then you needed to have a follow up by me on for appendix, appendix C. Right. Uh, so I, I can bring back the information that I received on that prior mm -hmm. to uh, oh, yeah. the yeah. action, if you'd like. Thank you, yeah. Uh, what uh, I, I did research on this afterwards. I called MMA the next day to follow up as to see what, what the regulations are. Uh, generally, the, the maxima are, are determined by looking at the local markets, but you do have the ability to either establish your own maximums or you may uh, decide to have no maximum. There is in Appendix A the overall maximum amount that's there, so that's your, your ceiling, if you will. But uh, you do have the ability to to use you know what you find is a reasonable amount here locally as long as you don't exceed the overall maximum. So. Uh, it may be worthwhile, I think, for, for this year to see where where that's at, uh, to understand, because I do agree with Council Randall that the maximums that they do have are low in comparison to what local local rates are for, un, for rental assistance. So it may be worthwhile to take a year and, and see what, what the results are and come back again next year and see what our experience is and then find, do, uh, the, max, do the maximums work? or do they not? It, it is overall assistance to the amount, so if a person has the ability to participate to the level that they can, then they can receive assistance to help them pay their rent, as well as for the other areas that you have already approved as far as utilities and heat and, and, and household supplies. So um, my recommendation would be to, to not set a maximum this year and, and see what it is, and then we can report back next year at this, pro at this time when, when they do come back to the council for approval to to determine. Any discussion to Council Randall? Just to clarify, are you suggesting we don't adopt Appendix C this year? Yeah, I'd say I'd say it'd be, it, you'd be, yeah. that would be my recommendation. Yes, and thank you. Is that data readily available so that when we look at this next year, we could have that information about how many people are using you know the housing amounts and food amounts, and we can generate we can generate that report. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> so the, the, the suggestion mo suggested yes, motion. Yes, the suggested motion this, would be <laughs> would be helpful. Uh, would yeah. be to not uh, to uh, adopt Appendix uh, C, but not a maximum amount. Okay. Uh, All right. Do not not setting a maximum amount for this year. So, is there a motion to adopt Appendix C without setting a maximum amount? So moved. Councilor Randall. Is I'll there a second? second? Councilor Penny Jordan. Any further discussion? Uh, discussion. Yes. Um, so, Councilor Straw. Uh, I'm, it seems like we should simply just not adopt C rather than adopt it with no limit, because I thought the point of C is it imposes the limits. But without adopting C, then there are no limits. So it seems like the action would be that we take no further action because we already adopted the other appendices, but or, I could be wrong. Or, may, or maybe, yeah, or maybe you could say to not accept, not adopt Appendix C and then and then move forward. Yeah. E either way, uh, as long as you make sure that we're not adopting the minimum, that's the most important stretch here. Do I don't disagree with you, Chris. I, I question, though, do you need to, uh, in order to uh, implement Appendix C, do you need to have adopted it? Is it can you, yeah. in, in order to have the guy, in order to, to say we max. have a C, uh, there, but we have no max. Uh, but we have an Appendix C which addresses housing, heating, and utilities. I would think we'd have to have something that addresses housing, heating, and utilities. But I'm not a lawyer. Oh. Okay, if you don't mind, just a, just a moment to, to yeah. jump in. Mm -hmm. I guess my, my recommendation would be then to not, uh, not adopt Appendix C or 
to take no action, as Councillor Straw may have said, because yeah, reading here it says not all municipalities should adopt these rec suggested housing maximums. So that you could say to take no action would probably be the cleanest way to, instead of having a negative motion, which you can't have. Yeah, mm -hmm. but there will be no, what my key is, is that when somebody needs GA, I don't want there to be a barrier to access. Right, no, they, okay. still have, they still have to qualify under the, under the okay. income standards and guidelines. It's okay. just what the, the housing maximum would do would, would set the, uh, the ceiling as the amount uh, would have to be at that suggested amount that they have. Okay. So, but okay. they still have to qualify by the, by the guidelines and everything else would, would flow uh, accordingly. So, is there any more? Do I withdraw my motion then? Or vote it down. Yeah, Pardon? Maybe, maybe wise. Or vote it down. Yeah, we could vote it down. And then there could be a new motion. Or just no motion. Right, we need no, I think we need no motion. At yeah, this you point. can take no action. Yeah, okay. So we'll just t take no action, no yeah. vote, no anything. That's no, as as no, we have to vote. Have to, we have to vote the current motion down. Or she yeah. can withdraw it. Or I'll, or I'll withdraw. withdraw my motion yeah. then. So you withdraw your motion. I, I did. I hesitated because I was trying to look at the language, but I see that it does say that you can just not adopt Appendix C. And then you have to withdraw your second. Yeah. Yes, but but well, procedurally, like we either. Vote it down, or you you at, you withdraw your motion. Right. Procedurally, I withdraw my motion. Okay. Thank you. And, and I need to. Say, no. You withdraw your second. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Straw. So then, in effect, the sheet that we have, that's page five of the PDF, which sets the maximums, has a giant blank for Appendix C housing maximums. So then we're we're good. Right. Yeah. That. Uh, it, Give me just a yes. moment. Um, yeah, you would. You'd be taking on everything except that one housing maximum section there. Got it. Uh, at least the grid that's below it, because it has it for all different counties and everything. But it would, you would just be looking at the top. Where, since you took no action, then we would not have adopted any of them. Okay. And then what? I, what I will do is I'll report back to the council next year to let you know how what our results are at this prior to prior to the, this discussion taking place again. <laughs> okay. A anything else? All right. So we'll move along. Item number 142, the Perpudic Club licenses. Uh, I need to disclose that I am a member of the Perpudic Club. I feel I can vote with, with objectivity on this license application. If anyone is, objects, no. Okay, thank you. Would anyone like to speak to this item from the public? No? All right, moving on. I'd like to ask the town clerk to introduce this item. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, as we do for other liquor licenses, uh, we uh, send the application off to uh, the fire chief, police chief, and codes officer to see if they have any questions and concerns. They do not with these licenses. It would be to approve the annual malt, vinous, spiritualist license and mobile service bar and special amusement permit for the Paputa Club. A special amusement permit is required for establishments with liquor that have dance. It's, that's in a nutshell Standard, what that yeah. license is. So okay. uh, with that, we would uh, recommend adoption. Okay. Is there a motion to uh, adopt, excuse me, I'll get the wrong page myself. Is there a motion to approve the Malt, Venice, and Spiritus license and mobile service bar license and special amusement permits for the Perputic Club located at 300 Springwick Avenue? As presented. So, Council Lennon. So moved. Is there a second? Councilor Randall, any discussion? Hmm? All those in favor? It's unanimous. <laughs> Item number 143, proposed commercial ban, bus, vehicle, traffic, and fees. Uh, would anyone in the from the public like to address this item? Oh, seeing no one, we'll move on. Last night, uh, we had a workshop on uh, this item and um, had a lot more in-depth discussion. 
Um, I'm going to ask the town manager to highlight some of the, the things that we, that we talked about. He also uh, put together a very nice do a document that's kind of a synopsis of, of everything and as well as an Excel spreadsheet. So I'll, I'll ask him to highlight a couple of those items and then we can start our discussion. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, as, as you recall, last month the discussion was to adopt uh, many of the recommendations regarding to commercial van, bus, and vehicle traffic at the fort. Uh, all of those recommendations were adopted. Uh, the only outstanding item was the were the fees that were to be set. So at last night's council workshop, the, the concept was explored fully. Uh, ultimately, it came down uh, accepting majority of the recommendations uh, for the changes in the fees. I want to thank Jim Kearney because he actually provided uh, this uh, additional spreadsheet that you received this afternoon uh, that uh, brought into the model how the uh, different fees would impact the, the revenue at the fort related to these uh, to these fees. The large changes that were, were there were to change the uh, trolley fee uh, from the existing $1,700 for the season to $3,000 for the season. And then the other would be the change to change uh, on the motor coaches or buses from what is currently $50 uh, for the uh, per trip or 45 once you got beyond a specified volume of trips. Uh, to $150 and $140 per trip. So those uh, those changes would be in place once the council or the council decided to make those changes. Those uh, and the impacts that they had on revenues are identified on that spreadsheet, but uh, this would reflect uh, or would be taking impact in the next season. So the next summer is when these, uh, these fees would be in place for. Okay. <coughs> Is there a motion to adopt the uh, amended fee schedule for commercial van, bus, and vehicle traffic? Councilor Lennon? I move we adopt the proposed um, commercial fee, van and fees um, for the coming year. Is there a second? I'll second that. Councilor Penny Jordan? Any more discussion? Councilor Randall? I'm unclear on, we got, we got the updated one today. This afternoon, yeah. So which, what are we voting, or what are we voting on specifically? Specific, uh, mm -hmm. if I may. Uh, specifically it would be that the trolley fees are $3,000 for the season and for the motor coaches, it would be $150 per trip to a certain volume that, that has been identified at 75 visits. And then after 70, the 76 visit, it would go to $140 per trip. Uh, the others are forecasted revenues. Those are estimates, so you're not voting on, uh, on, on setting their forecasted revenues. It's just you're really setting the fees. So that's, that's what the model is for. Uh, and it also includes for the mini buses the fees being set at 50 and 2100 and the vans and limos remain at 25 and 550 right oh yes yes exactly thanks thanks to that councilor straw mm -hmm. okay all right everybody set on that or clear on on that councilor garden I, I, I thought that when we did the math last night the the revenue number for 2019 was what, that's, that's where Mr. Kearney helped, okay. helped out today. Uh, what I had in there was uh, almost a double count. Oh, okay. Was, once you get beyond the 75 visits, and that's... Got it, okay. So that was adjusted to correct the, uh, the motor coach visits that were above 75. Okay. <clears throat> Councilor Randall? So not to get stuck on the trolley issue, but it seemed pretty clear that, um, and. Jim is here to correct me if I am wrong, but it seemed pretty clear that what the committee was saying is that the major target are the motor coaches, and they didn't think that it was wise to dramatically increase the trolley fee, even for next year, but to do it a little more gradually. Is that, do you mind speaking to that? That was my recommendation, I think it was the recommendation of the committee. I thought that council Yep, and 
Just yeah, yeah. Last night, I mean, because a couple of the numbers that were thrown around were were to go to like 5,000 or great or, or greater numbers, and that's what Mr. Kearney had said. You know, more gradual. Because you were looking at almost a 50% increase from one year to the next on the trolley fees. Councilor Straw. So, uh, although I think uh, the fees, I, I thought the the actual fee amounts proposed match what um, we had discussed. Uh, the revenue estimates, I do think that does have a numerical issue in it, uh, where it shows the motor coaches for the season as twenty two thousand five hundred. It had assumed that unless there's a typo, the season traffic was five hundred motor coaches. I don't know if that number. That is a. Okay, so is it? <laughs> but either way, the fee structure is right. Yep, so. Yeah. Well. But that's why the, that the amount generated, the, the amount, estimates is. Yeah. As long unclear. as as long as we're clear on the fee structure, it's not as relevant that the, yep, the yep. rest of the math may not be correct. It's yep. the fee schedule we're, we're actually voting on. Uh, it, uh, yes, Matt. If I may, yeah, it, the, the most important part yep. of it is, is the fee amounts that the council will be setting. The, the revenue estimates themselves are, as we were talking about last night, with bus volumes All right. fluctuating. If they go up a lot next year, then the volume could be, you know, the revenues could be greater. This is just based on the, you know, the estimates of where you're at, but the fee is really the, really important. That is what the council ultimately would be setting uh, this evening. Okay. Everybody set on that? Any more discussion, questions? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Item num number 144, request from the <coughs> Conservation <coughs> Committee for council direction on the dog ordinance. Would anyone from the public like to speak to this item? <coughs> you have three minutes. Your name and address, please. Thank you. <laughs> um, Jeremy Gabrielson. I live at Five Rocky Knoll Road. I am currently chair of the Conservation Committee. Um, so I just wanted to tee this up for council um, briefly. So the, uh, am I not? Uh, yeah, it may be my, my ears, um, but yeah. So uh, back in the spring, council had referred a review of the dog ordinance to the conservation committee. Uh, the particular issue was some language in the ordinance around what areas were allowed for off-leash stemming from the current ordinance referring to groomed areas versus ungroomed areas and not having a, a definition for what those areas are, which um, the police chief informed us made the ordinance difficult to enforce. So uh, what the committee has looked at is rather than defining groomed areas and ungroomed areas is taking the approach of looking at specific properties that are in town ownership and <coughs> categories of on leash, on leash under voice control and, and no dogs, different categories of, of, of use that would be applied to those properties. With a clear public record, the chief feels that we could have one area, for example, Cliff House Beach be in category one during the summer season and then move it to category two, which would be, or, or you know, whatever the categories might be for specific time periods. So uh, the committee, before diving too farther in, <laughs> too much farther into that ordinance work, wanted to come back and just get a sense from council if that seems like a sensible approach um, to bringing some greater clarity to the dog ordinance. There are also some other issues in the ordinance that don't relate specifically to that issue of having groomed areas versus ungroomed areas. So um, the committee is looking for guidance on whether they should be looking at the whole ordinance or just re restricting the review to that one section that's proven problematic. Um, and then lastly, uh, one of the other questions that the committee had was in order to, so one of the problems that's come up with Cliff House Beach is this area, a question of inappropriate dog use. It may be that we want to have the off-leash off or um, dog, no dogs allowed period start in September this year. Next year the neighbors come back and say, you know, actually it'd be better if it was October 1. Um, just adjusting those time periods. And so the question of 
what body should make those decisions as to moving dates or changing categories. The ordinance could be structured so that that stays with council as a decision, or it could be structured so that the committees that are responsible for the properties in question would have delegated authority to adjust the categories for dog use. So I'm glad to take any questions if you have any. Council Lennon. Um, so I'm not gonna be around for this discussion, but <coughs> So you started by saying the three categories, leash, no leash, and voice control? So actually the three categories that we've talked about at this point, it, it, we could have four categories. <laughs> um, but the three, the three basic categories would be um, no dogs allowed, okay. um, dogs, dogs allowed on a, on a leash, and dogs allowed under voice control. Um, those, are, those, are, that's, those are realistically the three categories that we have now. Um, okay, because I mean, it's my experience that voice control that's just saying your dog's free because people, I mean, it's a joke, right? There are occasional dogs that actually are under voice control and that's like incredibly impressive, but they're like 5%. So, you know, I'm just saying people are like, well, come, come, well, you know, while the dog's jumping all over you, come on, come on, and that's not voice control. So I would just have it be no dogs allowed, dogs on leash or dogs off leash. Because to me, it's just naming a truth. Thank, thank you. Yeah, we, we actually um, referred uh, review of it, uh, ordinance, dog ordinance to the Conservation Committee in March. And yeah, that's what it says in March. Um, <clears throat> our recommended action tonight is to set this to a workshop. This is a fairly comprehensive and somewhat complicated issue and I'm sure you know, you'll probably have at least one workshop on this. I, I, I would voice an agreement with Councilor Lennon that and I have had all dogs all of my life and have trained to various levels. And voice control is almost non-existent. I mean, you, you're talking levels of dog obedience training that you know you you, you rarely see. Um, you know, certainly in areas like this. I mean, it, it does exist, but it's. I think that having that as a you know. It, it, as a level of use is fraught, personally. I would rather just see on leash, off leash, or whatever. But, um, so I would just agree with Council Lennon on that, because I, I just don't think that that's realistic at all. But anyway, our action tonight on this item is to set it to a workshop. Could I ask a question? Sure. Um, so, Jordan. Do we want it to go to workshop before, well maybe it does say it goes to work, because when do we want them to look at the whole ordinance before it goes to workshop? Um, you know, that's a good question. I mean, I, I was thinking Rather of, than play that ping yeah, pong game? Yeah, I was thinking that as well. My, my thought was, though, looking at you know our agenda, was that <clears throat> it might help the ordinance committee. You know, in, in other words, you're thinking just go right to ordinance rather than have a general workshop. Is that no, what you're... No, I think there's some question. Am I missing a point here? Because I... Oh, okay. But yeah. I... Yeah, the, may I, I? I have a clarifier if it might if it may help. They, yeah. they have uh, the way the council referred it to the uh, conservation committee was to review seven section seven dash one dash seven, and one of the areas that they'd like to have guidance on is if you want them to you know basically get together the workshop show what what they've had and what they've worked to up to this point, but then say, you know, you've really kind of confined us to this area. Do you want us to look at the whole? My the question was, do we need to go to workshop in order to say that? Because that's like a logical next step rather than yeah. go sit down in another meeting and say, oh, by the way, what you asked a month ago is really what makes sense. That's just, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something, but it's, it, 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 it doesn't make sense to me to sit in a meeting, sitting there going, well, you know, maybe we should have looked at this other part of the ordinance. I would say conservation commission, can you look at the whole thing? And uh, can then let's all sit down uh, because then we've got a more comprehensive view. Um, and then um, do the proposal of, and here would be the uh, different overseeing bodies. And that to me is a workshop. 
Then you roll up your sleeves. I, I agree with you. Yeah. Just let both people look at the whole thing. I just wanted to go on record. Sarah and I agreed. <laughs> <laughs> and Jessica and I agreed. Yes. <laughs> We're going out in a flurry. If, if, I, if I may, then just, yeah. just for clarification, would, you, yeah. would that, I mean, if, if you want to send the direction to the ordinance committee that you don't need to have a workshop, but you would recommend to that the they conservation a, uh, sorry, yeah, conservation committee, committee that they review the entire they, board. Yeah, do a full ordinance modernization, then okay. we can like deliver that message to you know that would be my suggestion. tomorrow. She can, and the chairman is still here tonight, so we can share that that message from there. So if if you'd like to make that type of motion, then that would work. Oh, I need to make a motion. She might be so kind. <laughs> Just say, so moved. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what you want to move is that. What matches that? That I, I, I would like to ask the yeah. Conservation Commission to look at the full ordinances as they relate to dogs, um, at the full ordinance. And uh, then we would come back and, and report then, back to the council. Then report back to yeah. the council. And then at that point, the new council may decide to set a workshop, but okay. I'll right. second is there, that for you. Is there, did, did you just second it? Okay, any more discussion? Council Straw? So I'm gonna vote yes. Um, the one hesitation I had is, um, although it sounds like the Conservation Committee has already looked into this, they know, they're familiar with what other towns are doing. Um, it just seemed odd that we're sending the ordinance to the Conservation Committee to rewrite an ordinance as opposed to the Planning Board, but I'm totally fine with it. Mm -hmm. Well, my there. understanding is, I mean, we're not asking them to rewrite it. We're asking them to study it, and they'll make some recommendations. They're, they are so intimately involved with animals in our Greenbelt Trails, our open spaces, and this, this was the, the reason why we asked them to, you know, to start looking at this in the first place is because they have a lot of experience with multi-use trails and open space and animals and people and all that. So, so just, to, just to make recommendations. Uh, given everything else they've learned about, you know, multi-use in our trails and open space so properties. Council Garvin. Um, during your discussions at the committee level on this, have there been, um, what, have there been active participants from, I know there's a couple of different organized dog groups in town, have they been actively participating with you on this? Or? Yes, uh, we've had a lot of participation from the um, dog walkers groups as well as a, a handful of neighborhoods that have been experiencing more issues with dogs. Okay. Yep. Councilor Randall? Um, there's a summary in the document that was sent to us by the committee and they posed a number of questions. Should we maybe try to answer those questions before sending it back to them for review? I think we did answer somewhat the, the first one that we would like them to review the entire dog ordinance. But with regard to the second and third questions? I'm not pulling it up. I don't have the page numbers it's on page, my yeah, It's, it's the, the enforcement board. categories and uh, the oversight bodies. I think the categories that are laid out there make sense. Um, so I would say that as you go through the ordinance, you may identify another another one, but I can't imagine. It's like you covered the waterfront with those. Uh, the oversight categories, the only question I would have is, um, and I'm not opposed to it, I'm just saying that um, understanding the, the, the rationale for conservation committee to be oversight for town open space. I know you're already, um, the committee's already oversees the open space, so I understand the logical connection, but I don't know what the, um, uh, what the implications are of that. If I may, I think the, the concept here was there, um, for a property like Winnick Woods, um, for example, that gets a high level of use, there may be periods where, for whatever reason, the c committee feels that a change from one category to another is needed to um, 
deal with problems that may arise. And that rather, since, since that committee already is talking with the dog, the various users who use that mm -hmm. property, it basically just saves council time to, mm -hmm. for them to be able to work with the users to make minor adjustments uh, mm -hmm. of that nature. Cool. Councilor Randall? Um, I personally really like the idea of the enforcement categories, and I think you guys did a really nice job looking at a creative approach. Um, I do think, because I always favor consistency in laws, I think that the third one with the, with the changes in enforcement categories could get a little bit messy, but I'm interested to hear more, maybe different ideas that allow for some flexibility, but maybe not as much flexibility. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. I had some similar concerns, but I'm willing to let them put a proposal together and let me Thank review you. it. But mm -hmm. I still think you're going to need to convince me that it should be outside the council's control right. to, to change all those things. So, but put put it together and let's see what it looks like. Right. So we had a motion. And a second. Any any more discussion? All those in favor? Which um, actually, you you were gonna, you had more discussion. Oh no no no. Would you read the motion again, please? Sure. It's to ask the conservation committee to review the full dog ordinance and review back to excuse me and to report back to the town council. Great. Thank you. And I I would just wonder what would a time frame on that be? Do you think? Um, yeah, um, if you don't mind, ask answering. Well, I, can, I can only speak for the agenda for the next yeah. meeting. Right. <laughs> um, I would suspect that this will be on the December agenda. Um, I would think probably the committee would report back to council either after the January meeting or February meeting. Okay. Um, it's a pretty high okay. um, importance agenda item for the committee. Great. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, item number 145, town council to provide next steps to the town manager on pay and display parking at Fort Williams Park. Would anyone from the public like to uh, address the council on this item? Seeing no one, we'll move along. Uh, again, we had a workshop last night. We reviewed a, a lot of this in great detail. Um, We've had several workshops on this. Um, last night, the town manager uh, had put together a document, I mentioned that earlier tonight, and in which he kind of outlined scenarios for implementation and management. So I, I, if you don't mind, would you, just for the audience and for the council again, just mention some of the highlights of, of that for us? I'd be happy to, Madam Chairman, thank you. Uh, as, as Council Chairman did say, this has been worked on on multiple different uh, front, fronts. Uh, definitely thanks to the Fort Worth Park Committee with the subcommittee that came forward with a comprehensive analysis uh, earlier this summer, or late, late, or early this fall, late this summer. Uh, so I've, uh, I've tried to advance some of those based on the questions that have arisen from the public as well as uh, Council and as well as via email that we've received over the past uh, few months. Uh, really, what are we talking about when it comes to pay and display? Uh, pay and display is parking by fee seasonally, and this would be effective between May 1st and November 1st, uh, and then from November 1st to April 30th would be free for all. Metered pay and display parking would be in five premium parking lots, encompassing approximately 270 spaces. There are, and there will be areas for free parking to the rear of the park, up by the children's garden, in the playground area, up by Officer's Row. Overflow parking, toll avoidance, and keeping the park affordable for all means is the intention of the free parking area. Overflow and toll avoidance by parking in the abutting neighborhood will be consistently monitored to make sure that, it, that we are able to address that going forward. If the park is full, then appropriate signage will be deployed and the volume should be monitored by the park coordinator and the rangers. Now what's changed since the last time the conversation has taken place? the volume of visitors has increased, changing from 190,000 visits and estimated 500,000 visitors in 2009 with a breakdown of 72% of main residents to 28% out-of-state residents to 
approximately 277,000 visits this past year and 900,000 visitors in 2018, with 40% of Maine residents and 60% being out-of-state residents. The increase in volume is expected to continue. And as you may have just noticed, the relationship between resident to non-resident use has reversed over the past nine years. The increase in volume will continue the need for infrastructure investments to improve the safety and effective management of the park and potential large expense items such as restroom facilities and proper waste management could be, could be addressed. Parking fees would allow the increase in use to offset future expenses due to, revenue, due to the revenue generation. It's important to note that Cape Elizabeth taxpayers have supported the park largely by property tax revenues. Pay and display parking fees provide the opportunity for non-resident users to support the park through reasonable user fees. The revenue will help achieve the Fort Williams Park vision statement to optimize the town's stewardship in managing the park through financially and ecologically sustainable practices. Now, considering the changing relationship in user volumes, the economics of the Park Committee's research, the vision statement approved by the Council, public comment requesting the town search for alternative revenue sources other than property taxes, the continued reductions in state revenues in all forms, and the long-term financial and capital needs of the park, I recommend advancing pay and display parking. I'm also aware that this is the Council's decision to make and deeply respect your duties. This document is aimed at increasing the volume of information you have on this subject to be able to make a fully informed decision. One important attribute that has, has changed over the course of this discussion and has been clarified is that residents would now be able to park for free with the display of an annual parking pass available at the police department. That's a change where originally we were looking at residents needing to buy an annual pass, but now they would be able to park for free. Non-residents would pay $2 per hour with a maximum, oh sorry, with a minimum two hour parking uh, charge for $4, with a maximum fee for a day for ten, at $10. Or if one is so inclined and wanted to have a season pass as a non-resident, they could pay $15 for a season. This fee structure is very compatible and reasonable in comparison to surrounding communities. Examples of surrounding fees are as such. Portland charges $3 per hour for flat lots, $28 per day. York has a different uh, situation there where their premium parking is $2 per hour on, along the beach and a dollar for their lesser, uh, lesser parking areas per hour. Saco charges $2 per hour for their flat lots uh, at the beach as well as $150 for a season pass. And Scarborough is $1 per hour along Bayview, which is a road that parallels Higgins Beach, or, $40, or for if you are a resident, you can buy a season's pass for $40. If you are a non-resident, $150. Or if you wanted to just go for the day at one of their three uh, flat lots at Higgins, Higgins Beach, down at Pine Point, or at Ferry Beach, it's $15 per day. In the event that there are sports teams that are playing, such as t-ball, softball, soccer, at the fort, we could generate special codes that would be able to be programmed to allow sports clubs and their visitors to park for free. Uh, so that would take that out of the equation. And then in the event that there are special events, such as Beach to Beacon or Family Fun Day, that could be a free parking day at the <coughs> fort. That's a decision for the council to make, quite frankly. Now, how would parking be managed? Ultimately, the suggestion would be to begin by a leasing approach, combining, combining with outsourcing enforcement. In researching this subject, I've also met with manufacturers of meters, leasing companies, enforcement equipment and software companies, and parking management companies. And I think there's a great deal of interest in going forward, at least providing that service to us without a great capital expenditure to start for the town. This would be the most effective way and economically way to approach it. Now, the approach for the process. Step one would be the permission from the council to move forward. We would definitely need to, to know where the council stands. With that permission in hand, the next step would be to write up a request for proposals to get uh, requests for proposals from parking management, including equipment and enforcement, would probably be the best way to go about it, especially after last night's conversation with the council at the workshop. Send out these requests for proposals after the start of the year, review them, determine the best, 
the best approach of uh, what we receive for request for proposals and bring back a recommendation to the council. At the same time, the ordinance committee will be working on crafting an ordinance for parking. And that is currently uh, on the ordinance committee's agenda for December. The next step from that point, uh, as discussed last night, would be probably to come back with a comprehensive full package for the town to consider uh, and then say, you know, you'd have the ordinance in place as well as the enforcement and management of, of parking. And then the council can make a decision at that point with a complete package to go forward with. And then if approved, we would begin an education and outreach program to, to let folks know that this change would be coming. And then the pref obviously, if we could implement it by May 1st, we'd be able to capture the next season. Uh, that's pretty much what we have uh, to report this evening. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the streamlined uh, report that I have on that. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, we did have quite quite a in-depth discussion last night on all pretty much all aspects of this. Um, would anyone like to discuss things further, or is anyone ready to make a motion? And the way we the way the agenda is set up, the, I think the motion would be to adopt pay display and authorize the town manager to proceed with uh, his request for proposals. But what, something Sorry, like wait. that. Could you repeat what you just said? The, the way the agenda set up, it would be what? Well, I, what I'm th what I'm thinking, and I'm just th throwing this out there. Would it be to the adoption of paid display? You have to adopt the concept, and then authorize the town manager to uh, proceed with requests for proposals. Or is it just requests for proposals? I mean, I, I don't know. That's it. Councilor Straw, I think you were I'd first. I had her hand up first, so. Okay. <laughs> no, I would go with the latter. I think okay. I'd like to um, direct Matt to set out a request for proposals, and then when we get those proposals back, then we'll be able to take the next step as to decide if we're jumping in on this for approval or pay and display. All right. Councilor Straw? Uh, I feel the same way, so I'll make right. the motion then. Um, and although Matt indicated uh, one way, I think I, I'd like to give you the flexibility to get both of them so we can do an apples to apples comparison. So motion, uh, I move that we authorize the manager to uh, issue a request for proposals for parking management, including equipment and enforce enforcement, as well as a, uh, issue a request for proposals for purchasing the equipment for pay and display parking, including installation as well as requests for proposals for providing enforcement services for pay and display parking. Is there a second? Councilor Randall, any more discussion? No. Councilor Garvin? Um, I mean, you guys heard me say this last night, but I'll say it for the benefit of the public here and anybody watching. I, what I, um, and Matt laid it out very clearly, but just to underscore and reiterate the point that um, there, there will need to be a level of public engagement on this, and what we're doing tonight is <clears throat> taking one step to try and advance all of this to the point where an entire fully um, considered proposal along with the supporting ordinances that would be necessary to enact this would be something on the table for not only the council but the public to weigh in on. So this is in no way an action tonight to um, you know, accelerate approval of the of the decision on whether or not to do this. This is an important and needed step in order to get a lot of um, specific and critical information um, to be able to make a fully formed decision. So that's one thing. The other thing is I do want to um, um, publicly thank the um, Fort Williams Park Committee and their subcommittee that's worked hard on this. Um, I know that um, there you know has been uh, comment and concern raised about. Um, you know, the council's attentiveness to this. Uh, I would say, as I did last night, that I think we are being appropriately deliberate in how we go about this, that this is a, a potentially major change um, and uh, that we, you know, we're moving, um, you know, with with thorough consideration and, and, and appropriate caution um, rather than just jumping into this. So um, we're, we still have plenty of time between now and, and when the, the, you know, the peak, peak season would be in effect. 
Um, so I think if we work efficiently during that time, you know, we, we have all the possibility of, of being able to be, um, you know, in market, so to speak, for, for next spring, if that's the decision that's made. But um, I, I do want to make sure that, um, you know, the, the committee feels like their work has been valued, which it, it's, to me, been of tremendous value. So thank you very much. Any other comments? Well, I'd like to thank the Fort Williams Park Committee and the subcommittees as well. I mean, last night was our third third workshop this year anyway on this issue. Um, I, I certainly am hoping that future council proceeds with this. I see this as a critical budget issue for the town. Um, again, as I've said before, we average $250,000 uh, in costs from the taxpayer above any revenues received. We've got approximately $6 million in deferred maintenance that needs to take place. Um, we have, because of the explosive use in uh, Fort Williams, we have management issues. We need people on the ground. There's, there's a great deal that needs to happen there, so I'm, I'm certainly hoping the council will move forward with this. You know, the, this is something we've been dealing with for many, many years. It's been an issue for years. And none of this is new other than the incredible increase in use. Um, so I, I certainly will keep my fingers crossed and be watching going forward because I think given all the, the, the demands on the taxpayer, the burden of, on the taxpayer, uh, the school department wants, you know, again, as, as they wanted, have been bringing out la this past spring, will be continuing um, to hope for a bond. We are the oldest town in the oldest state. We have a growing community of retirees and the burden on the taxpayer is increasing. And so um, we certainly have uh, many historical references in our community of interest in user fees and a search for other revenue areas. And I think given, given the needs that we have at the park and the incredible use by others, um, I certainly am hoping that the town council will proceed in this direction. But anyway, thank you very much. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number, <coughs> excuse me, item number 146, request for two town council members to participate on the needs assessment committee organized by the Cape Elizabeth School Department. Is an opportunity for someone to speak to this item. Would anyone like to speak to this? seeing no one. Um, the, the school department has already actually had their first needs assessment meeting um, <clears throat> looking at uh, uh, school facilities and a needs assessment towards per, perhaps presenting another um, plan for uh, renovations and for a, a bond. Um, they've asked that um, two counselors participate and I understand that last night in the caucus you, you've come up with names. <laughs> So, and I understand those names to be uh, Councilor Jamie Garvin and uh, right now Councilor-elect Valerie Devereaux. So, is there a motion on the table to appoint Councilor Garvin and Councilor-elect Devereaux to represent the council on the Needs Assessment Committee? So moved. Second. There's a second. Any, any other comment? Councilor Garvin? Um, I would just, um, I guess for point of clarification, uh, there is a meeting on Wednesday, November 28th, which proceeds, uh, and I actually, I think there's another one on December 6th. Uh, uh, is it the, f I thought it was the 5th, but it, it any, Whatever that Wednesday is, yes, you're correct. But, um, so anyway, there are two meetings preceding uh, the installation of Councilor elect Devereaux. Um, I see no concern with her participating in those meetings um, and would hope that the council agrees with that, so. Good point. Yep, there, and, and I, the superintendent informed me that there, at these these meetings, uh, there there won't be voting per se. These are information gathering meetings, and so council elect will will not be in a position of actually voting as a as a full council or representative of the council. So there, there shouldn't be any shouldn't be any problem at all. So the, the other thing I would add, if I may, is that. Um, all of you are invited to participate right. yeah. in this. Um, so, you know, recalling back to the many discussions in the spring um, and people feeling like they didn't have enough information, they wanted to ask more questions, they wanted to vet things more thoroughly, this is that chance. So um, I, think, I think 
you know, both the community and the school board have, you know, heard and responded to um, people's concerns about how we go about this process and making sure that, um, you know, uh, any priorities are appropriately scrutinized and things like that. So um, I, I hope, you know, I, I understand we all have, um, you know, a lot of other things going on, but I hope that you all find opportunity to either participate in the meetings or come and, come and, and, and observe them or at least be um, highly engaged in the issue. So thank you. Yep, and I'd also like to add these these needs assessment committee meetings, uh, they're planning for four of them. And at the end of these four meetings, the committee, this committee will then decide whether or not a full needs assessment of the school facilities needs to take place. And if so, how is that going to be funded? So this really is like a first phase set of meetings. So anyway, but thanks. Yep, come uh, Matt. If I have uh, one, one point to raise is we do have this now linked on the town's website under hot topics. So if anyone <laughs> wants to go there to find, it'll direct you to the school's website. But, uh, we established that this afternoon. So if you need to get there, that's the most direct approach. Okay. Uh, motion on the table has been seconded. And all those, any more discussion, actually? Okay, all those in favor? It's unanimous, okay. Next item, number 147, a joint town council school board workshop. The town council will consider scheduling a workshop with the school board on December 17 to continue discussions of mutual interest as reviewed at the October 23rd joint workshop. Councilor, uh, tell me if, has if, a comment. Yeah. If, if I may, Madam Chairman, uh, we're actually after uh, trying to, uh, during the caucus last night, trying to get calendars aligned. Uh, we're mm. looking at the, the 18th now at 6.30. December 18th? Yes. At 6.30, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there a motion to schedule this workshop as noted by the town manager, Councilor Garvin? I moved. Is there a second? Councilor Lennon, any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. All right, thank you. And the last item, number 148, the election overview. Um, as you all know, we had a tremendous turnout this past election day, and many people waited a very long time <laughs> to vote. And there were other, other issues as well with the increasing turnout we're having. Uh, 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 that we've had recently. Um, <clears throat> several of us, have, of us have been approached by citizens with comments and questions such as, why can't we just get some more voter machines and why do we have to stand in line so long and so forth and so on. It's a pretty complicated process, so I'd like to ask Deb Lane, our town clerk, to um, mention a few things about this. I did, after you know, we had such a tremendous turnout and such long lines, I did ask, I did speak with the town manager and the town clerk about, let's have something on the agenda. You know, we've had discussions about this in the past now and then, um, but I thought if we can get this on the agenda, start a formal discussion, and then as the council moves forward, you know, this is this will be on your mind because there may be budget implications if if you know the decision is made. But it's a complicated process, so let let me ask, let Deb address what's involved in getting voter machines and things like that. Great, thank you very much. And excuse my voice, it might. Well, we're both know, kind of stay with me or not. But <laughs> um, I think first of all, what I'd like to say is that we are always looking to improve the voter experience. I don't want folks to say, to think that because um, this election was, um, you know, there were long lines and, and different things and a great voter turnout, that this is the first time that we're looking to improve things because we really always do in my 33 plus years, we always have. So I think that that's important to note. Um, there are kind of three things that have come up recently that, that folks have commented on that I just wanted to comment on. And, and like you say, the machines, uh, a couple of people have said, why don't you just get bigger, faster machines? Well, we can't. Um, this machines must be state certified. The state is at the end of its five-year lease. I was at a meeting two months ago, and specifically I asked the Deputy Secretary of State, what's next? What are we looking at? Well, when we got the machines that we have now, that was federally funded, and those federal funds are gone. So we're not sure what the funding's gonna look like. 
or who's going to pay. My sense is we're going to pay maybe quite a bit more. Um, also, I said, what type of machines? It looks like these voter tabulation machines are still going to be the technology. And it's interesting that you look at other states now that, that have um, the you know machines, not the voter tabulation machines, and some of those states and electoral districts are looking to go back to paper ballots with the voter tabulation machines. I just think that's kind of interesting. So we're waiting right now <coughs> Me, for the state to send out an RFP to let us know what our financial obligations are going to be uh, moving forward. I hope that as we enter the fiscal year 2020 budget that I'm going to have some concrete numbers for you. Um, when we look at um, the election and we were looking at the lines and so forth, you know, how many machines is going to get someone through in a half an hour? Well, we can't afford all that. That's, that's not going to happen. But we figure maybe one more set of machines. We've talked to a couple of neighboring communities, particularly Scarborough, who is double our population and, and so forth. They had actually three sets of machines. So we're looking to possibly have three sets of machines uh, and then another set for the absentees, which has to be um, separate. So again, budget implications, but I'm hoping to have more solid numbers uh, for you when we review the next budget. Um, a couple folks said, why do we have to have three ballots? Well, if you recall in June, the voters voted in, ranked choice voting, and because of the way those um, candidate um, races have to be set up, it takes up more room. So I don't see us ever being able to have now candidates on one side, referendum on the other. So I think we're always going to have two state ballots. And of course, we have our municipal election, so the municipal ballot as well. So when you look at that, we've added a ballot. So that's adding to um, the lines as well. Uh, there was a suggestion, why don't you just get computers so you can check us in quicker? We can't. State law says we have to have a paper incoming voter list. So unless and until those laws change, we have to go with the paper uh, incoming list as it is. So, you know, again, um, please, you know, know that we are looking at things. We're doing our best. Um, I, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, the election staff. Um, we pulled staff from almost all municipal departments, not quite, but almost, from several of the school departments to, to pull this off and talking about teamwork. Um, we pulled, um, you know, members of our community to come in, and some of those members are literally in this room for several weeks prior to the election. So it's not only election day that we're geared up for and have a X number of hour day, it's the month before. We processed almost 3,000 ballots, excuse me, 3,000 absentees times three ballots um, in this election, and every one of those we sit there and put in one at a time. So. Um, it's quite a process. So if folks don't come on election day and they do absentee, that's a whole other thing. So, so again, talking, you know, with Matt, uh, he realizes there's going to be some budget implications as well, additional staffing if we can get them, and that's a whole other thing. The way the laws are written, you have to have a balance of Republican, of major political parties, which now is Republican Democrats. So even though we might have ten people come forward, I'd like to work if they're all. These are ours, whatever, we can't necessarily use all of them either. So again, unless and until those type of laws change, um, we're, we're with these laws that we have to have the balance. Frankly, um, what we do is administrative. I'd like to see the political piece of it taken out. I'd rather be able to hire people that first are community-minded. I think those are some of the best uh, workers that we have and those that you know can handle election day and understand laws and, and so forth. So I'd like to see some of that political piece pulled out and get back to administrative because that's what we do. The folks in Augusta, they can talk about all that stuff, but when, when it comes down to us where the rubber hits the road, I'm hoping they take some of that out and, and realize that really what we do is administrative and I don't really care if you're a DNR or a Q or a G. Um, I just you know want you to be community minded and stick with us for long, you know, long days and long hours. So um, we will continue to monitor at the state level. They're a little bit busy right now. I'm not sure how much they've worked on the RFP in the last few weeks. Um, but 
they know that uh, the clerks um, are out there waiting for kind of next instructions on, on where we're going with things. So, and through the Clerks Association also, uh, I'll probably be talking to them about trying to lobby for, for changes uh, in laws too. I'm not sure how far we'll get, um, but um, if we can see some of the changes to kind of help us along, that, that will help um, as well. So, so again, I just kind of want to mention those things that folks had brought up and, and I don't want think, people to think that we're stalling and not doing it, but there literally are state laws out there that prevent us to do some of these things that probably would make things a little bit, a bit quicker, but until those change, we're, we're kind of stuck where we are on that. So, um, and again, I, I think it was good to have this on tonight as, as information and for the council to uh, kind of look to the 20, fiscal yeah. year 2020 budget wow. review. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. I mean, it's definitely going to be a heads up issue. For, <coughs> I'm gonna, I was going to ask Matt to speak to it uh, as well if you wanted to add to any of this that Councilor Garvin has, has wants to say something. Oh, sure. Yeah, we, uh, Debbie and I obviously have spoken quite a bit throughout the whole process. As, as she noted, uh, some of the important areas that we're looking at are. Uh, Equipment needs that we will be looking at, you know, as from a fiscal side for next year's budget, we will be adding in, uh, you know, additional equipment. We may also need one of the recommendations came from uh, uh, one of the workers was you may want to consider increasing the amount that you pay election workers from just above minimum wage to a little bit uh, greater number uh, because it is it is a competitive area. Uh, this year during the election season, we actually reached out to the Muskie School to see if we could get students who work who are in the program over there to get a, actually their first taste of municipal government at the uh, <laughs> grassroots <laughs> level uh, to try to see if they, you know, because to be honest, I mean, elections are a major, major component of what we do uh, as, as a local government. And this is a great opportunity, but we didn't get any takers. We may try earlier next year, but we, we're trying to turn over every stone. Uh, we are extremely grateful for the folks that we do have, but many of them are aging out of the process. Uh, we've had some very dedicated people for as long as I've been with the town, and, and some of them are just, quite frankly, not able to do a lot of that work. So we need to, we do need to fill those spaces. Uh, one other area that Deb and I had talked about was uh, one of the bottlenecks that happened was at the point of vo point of voting. So if we had one point to enter towards the two machines. We may, if we increase the volume of machines so instead of two machines, have three, <coughs> divvy them up and have them into three lines, which may speed that line up faster. That's one area that's, that one thing that Scarborough did uh, and other towns have done. So you kind of you divvy them up a lot quicker and get them in shorter lines because that seemed to be one, one of the larger bottlenecks were because from the inability to vote at one end, you couldn't, you didn't want to fill the whole room with folks standing in line with ballots. So it would then stop from the processing and the check-in point back into the cafeteria where the lines were. So. Uh, we have, you know, as Debbie had said, we have changed and changed and changed over the years and tried to adapt and make changes where they are, but it is, uh, it is a challenge. And one, the other area is looking legislatively to probably reach out to our, our representatives to say, would some of you willing to sponsor a bill taking that political party affiliation out? Because it is, as Debbie said, it's administrative. And in certain communities where there may be, a, you may be a lot heavier in one party than you may be in another. So I'm sure there are other towns that may be heavily Republican that are running into the challenge by not having any Ds, whereas you know, Cape Elizabeth has a higher number of Ds and it's difficult to recruit uh, and find ours uh, for what that is. When really it ends up being important to just be able to vote and vote effectively and, 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 and get through the process. So we have, we do talk about it. It's a, it's a constant conversation throughout the year and trying to do that plus, uh, you know, uh, respond to the changes that do take place in the voting in the voting place that, that there are. The, the ranked choice voting is an issue that, you know, is reality and now we just need to learn how to, how to work with it. But I, I think Debbie really has her pulse on it okay. and that we're good to go. So Garvin, thank you. Um, I just wanted to echo the sentiments that both Matt and, and uh, Chairman Sullivan shared earlier, um, thanking um, <coughs> Deborah and Carolyn Jordan, the election warden, and all of the staff. Um, Deb, you know, I've talked to you individually, but um, you know, I, I know that there were a couple of slings and arrows that, that went your way that day, but um, 
I was standing in the lobby the whole day. I had a pretty vested interest in the outcome, so uh, I was personally appreciative, but also got to experience, um, you know, those people as they were waiting in line, and I was pleasantly surprised at um, really hardly any complaining or, or, you know, gripes that were heard. Um, there was an odd energy, um, you know, that was in the building that was actually kind of um, inspiring to see. I don't think anybody wants to, you know, plan for that every election, but, um, you know, it, it, it was, uh, of the many, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people that came through the doors of the high school that day, um, you know, a, a couple of people may have had some crosswords, but um, the vast, vast majority of them were really, really appreciative of all the work you guys did. And so I also want to commend the public for that and, and thank you for your patience. Um, I did just want to ask one question because it was asked of me directly as to whether or not there would be any ever consideration to adding a second polling place. And so for example, we, um, you know, because it's become a no school day, we have not only the high school facility, but you know, the cafetorium at the middle school, for example, I'm well aware of the fact that that adds more people and more cost and more need to recruit people, and those are all challenges, but um, I just wonder if that's something that um, either you or the council going forward should entertain, so. We've, we've talked about it. Matter of fact, when we moved down to the high school 25 plus years now, we talked about it then, because um, as you know, we were voting here. This was one district and downstairs without an elevator was a second district. Um, so we talked about that then and, and, and we've talked about it recently. The question becomes where is that second, second polling location and, and how do you split uh, the list, so to speak, like other communities have uh, council districts. So maybe district three f through five will go here and one through two, you know, something like that. So we don't have that in our um, representative district. You know, the large majority are in district 30 and only a few hundred and 32. So we can't split it that way. So that logistic plus uh, just doubling everything, you know, double the board and double the machine, you know, all that. But but we have talked about that, and I, you know, I think we'll continue to talk about it. Um, but how do you make that split um, in, in the staffing? Um, do you have to have it be designated? Can it be? Can both be open? Do they have to? Do they have? So basically, if 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 there were two points of voting, is it possible to just say? go to the one that's less crowded? There <laughs> or do you, do you have to have there, it pre-designated? You have to have it pre-designated. Okay. There's a certain amount of time. You have to let the voters know in certain ways. Um, and the polling places that you have have to pass the uh, ADA requirements and different things. So so there would be, and that's why you know some people say, if you have a really small election, why don't you just move to town hall? Well, all the noticing and then noticing back and then the confusion. But you know, that, I mean, that certainly you know would be worked out. And then one last question I had. Um, so the one comment I did hear a lot um, standing in the lobby there was, oh, well, I'm just, uh, I'll for sure vote absentee next time. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, you know, cautious about the problem that may cause with you all being overwhelmed here for yeah. uh, the number of weeks leading up to the election. So um, I, you've probably heard the same thing and yeah. are going to be prepared for that onslaught yeah, we too. Have but, it, it make, yeah. I've got chills already just yeah. thinking about it because it's an, <laughs> the way the laws are, right? again, going back to the state laws, the way they are right now, it's an incredibly labor-intensive process. And if the state, if the legislature would at least pass early voting, those folks that come in here to vote, if we could have a machine set up, at least they could put their ballots through, that would be less that we have to put in one at a time. Um, we tried that through the legislature a few years ago, and basically what they said is they really didn't trust the clerks. They felt that results would get in, excuse me, get released earlier. Um, which we weren't pleased with that response because that's you know far from the truth. We wouldn't want to throw any or you know do anything that would, would jeopardize an election or confidence in the election. So uh, again, another legislative change, possibly trying to go down that of you know having some early voting would help um, with that. So um, yeah, in, either way, it's a lot. So um, I think we need to be prepared as best we can for both. Great, thank you. Any other comments? Also, straw. Uh, uh, I'll echo uh, what Jamie said and what Matt said and what Jessica said. So thank you very much. Um, you did an excellent job. That was uh, quite a turnout. Um, I actually worked as a poll worker in my early 20s, and um, I stuck out as a sore thumb. Uh, but it was a great experience. So I, I, I know what you went through. Um, uh, so. I, it, would you say that the primary bottleneck was the machines, or was it the check-in? Um, 
machines. You know, again, the the machines. It's it's not, you know, high high speed. It, it reads it one at a time, and it has to tell you it's all set. And I specifically again asked the deputy secretary of state, is there any way to speed that technology up? And the answer was no. And again, having that additional ballot because of ranked choice, that's you know that added to it as well. It, and then, so um, the lease period is coming to an end and they might then say you need a different type of machine. So we're kind of in a bind if we wanted to go and buy new machines right now because they could become obsolete right, they immediately. Wouldn't, they wouldn't write a yep. lease for us right now. So um, yeah. so it can sit on the back burner where we can be like, we'll get new machines. We're waiting. We're, okay. Yeah, we're waiting. But my sense yep. is it's going to be, a, and it might still be this DS200, I, yep. um, according to the Deputy Secretary of State, but we're not entirely sure. But um, I think it's going to be the same technology. Got it. Uh, so my one um, suggestion, uh, and I don't know if this is permitted, um, I was hoping you'd know. Uh, when I went up to submit my ballots, I put in my local one into the machine and then I put my one in for the state. Um, is it possible to have two separate lines? Because in effect, by having one person go up and insert both, you have, if you think about it temporally, one machine is sitting empty half the time because you're using this one and then you go to the next one and that one you were using sits empty because the next person wouldn't come up. So if we could separate those out, we would double the rate of the machines. If you could have one person continuously putting in this machine, well, the next person's putting in the next well, machine. I had a couple people yeah. ask that and there's two responses to that yeah. I have. The first one is because there's still two state ballots, the person, you can have everybody going in their municipal, there's still going to be a lag time because the two state ballots. Also, we like to have them together because we want to make sure that voters are depositing the ballots in. We had several people that said, I don't want to vote this one. Okay, can you take it out of your jacket? We have to account for it. Oh, got it. And, got it. Thing. and, and frankly, a couple folks, they were given, uh, and this did not happen more than once, maybe twice that I know of, um, that uh, the ballot clerk gave them two of the same instead of one candidate, one mm. referendum. So we caught that at that time. Got it. So for those two reasons, I, I would like to, I'd rather see us get an, a, a third set of machines or fourth yep. or whatever that number is. Got it. So that we can kind of monitor that. Got it. Right. Thanks. Council Lennon. I have a quick question, because I was going to ask you about the early voting. Um, because I smugly walked around telling them, I voted <laughs> early and I was the only person in the town hall. Like, what's wrong with you? Um, and everyone said, well, I love the energy there. And I was like, I do too. And you can go stop by and hang out. <laughs> Have some snacks and walk along the aisle and, talk and then you can leave. I mean, I'm, I'm being facetious, but I agree that next year there's going to be a lot of early voters. So my question is, if we could get the state to agree to let you feed the early votes into the machines, which seems utterly preposterous that they won't let you do that since they let you on the day. Would that, and, and, and a lot of people are voted early, would that be a short-term fix that would actually expedite things? It would help. It wouldn't help with the mail ballots. We get quite a few, ma few mail, but a lot of people do physically come in here themselves. Yeah. And actually some people don't like the absentee balloting because they're afraid that we're looking at their ballots as they open them. So more may come right. if we had right. an early voting because right. they're going to put that ballot right in the machine right, right. then and there themselves. It just seems, why wouldn't you be able to do it then and not on election day? Yeah. So given that we have newly elected two representatives to the state, one in the Senate and one in the House, do you suggest that we lobby them on that and say this is really would be really helpful and you guys yeah. could you bring it up yeah i'd like to that, see it through the clerks association as well so we have more yeah. more participants mm -hmm. yeah. and okay. saying hey guys you know you looked at it a few years ago you had concerns i, I think you need to, to trust your election officials that are going to do what's right and if i don't do what's right then yeah. i should be out yeah. so you know if you specifically do something that's against the law like giving you know run a tally right. before you, you right. know you're supposed to or something like that so so we I, should so you're suggesting we talk to Rebecca and um, Anne. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Okay. One, Council Straw. One last short comment. Uh, so um, once we reach the point where we do know what machines we knew uh, we will need going forward, um, I'd appreciate it. At that point, don't be afraid to ask if it's two, three, four, five more machines. Uh, this is one area where I'm willing to spend significant amount of money to ensure everyone, no one's turned away from the poll because they get there and there's a big line. So I think you do an excellent job, but if you need more resources, don't hesitate to ask. So. Yeah, I know All right, any, any more comments? Uh, 
is there anyone in the public uh, in the audience that would like to address the council on any other topic before we adjourn? Just one additional item. Okay. Uh, last night at the council workshop, the council discussed. Uh, well, we looked at calendars, and there was a conflict for the uh, workshop that was set up for December 13th. I would like to change that date. So if I could get a action from the council to change the date from December 13th to December 19th at 6 p.m. for the workshop. Uh, but we need to notice the public to let folks know so I need the council to make a motion to change the workshop from the 13th to the 19th. Okay, would anyone like to make that motion? Councilor so Garvin. <coughs> so moved. Is there a second? second. Councilor Penny Jordan, any discussion about changing that workshop? So changing it from December 13th at 7 December 13th. to December 19th at 6 p.m. Okay, everybody got that? Okay. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Councilor Lennon, are you voting? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's unanimous now. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, could I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Is there a second? I think Sarah just did her last. Sarah did. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All those in favor? We are adjourned. Happy Thanksgiving.